This is uh, the Nordic Animism Channel, and I'm a historian of religion, Rune Janu. Uh, here are some reflections on reconstructivism in uh, relation to animism. Uh, when I started History of Religions, uh, my original plan was to focus on uh, Nordic religion, but I got uh, very disillusioned because I found that most of what seemed attractive was uh, seemed so uncertain and, and veiled in the Christian bias of medieval writers that uh, there was quite limited uh, credible info. And I wanted to sort of learn about uh, religious knowledge, not biased, incomplete, decontextualized, faulty reflections of religious knowledge. So uh, long story short, I ended up um, moving my focus onto uh, African traditional religions instead. Um, the basic assumptions of the tr um, traditional way of, of looking at Nordic history of religions is a kind of scholarship that says, okay, we need to be able to see and describe pre-Christian contexts as three of distort, distorting influences as possible, right? Hence, we need to focus on and criticize these influences. So, if, for, in, for instance, if, if um, uh, Snorri Sturluson calls Odin an all-father, then we need to ask ourselves, is this is in fact a kind of Christian idea that he is perhaps imposing on an earlier material. Perhaps the idea of, of Odin as an old father cannot actually be said to be pre-Christian, but more of a Christian idiosyncrasy that ended up coloring Snorri's description, right? And as a scholarly project, this is obviously fine. Um, of course, there are always debates and questions. You know, for instance, if you're considering something like this, Odin as an old father, uh, then that could perhaps also be heathen motif, even though it looks Christians, uh, because religions often have similar motifs that look like each other. Uh, and in fact, all father deities are also normal in polytheist religion. So even though the idea of an all father sounds Christian, then it you know, could also be heathen. And it's difficult to find criteria to decide whether it looks heathen or whether it looks Christian. Anyway, but that's, that's kind of a different discussion. Uh, what I'm interested in, in here in this video is what happens when this particular scholarly project is adopted by contemporary people who are drawn to Nordic religion, reconstructivism. Uh, the idea of using this kind of scholarship to sort of reassemble a religion that happened a millennia ago, almost like a machine or a clock where you put all the clock wheels and screws and springs in the right place and they'll start working again. Um, now, to me, there's something fascinating, almost touching about this project, this will to reclaim ancient religiosity in, in that way. It's, a very, it's as if there's a very strong motivation inside it. Um, and um, I'm going to take one example of how reconstructivism is practiced and explain uh, what I think is the problem with it and how I think it, the project can be modified or uh, in order to better um, uh, reclaim past religiosities uh, and uh, I'll suggest moving focus away from reconstructing onto re-engaging, reforging relation through animism. Surprise, surprise! Um, but let me first start by disclaiming that, uh, that the specific reconstructivist position that I'm engaging here is only one guy's bit on this religious project. A seemingly representative and well-formulated bit but it's important to keep in mind that this reconstructivist position isn't exhaustive. There are likely there are many different ways of putting this idea into practice. So my doubts and criticisms might not count for all of them, and I'll just keep the writer here anonymous because I disagree quite a lot with him, uh, but he's probably a super nice guy, so I don't want, to, want him to feel like pub publicly flogged. Uh, and perhaps uh, one day I'll take a beer with him and we can laugh at this video, and he can flog me a little bit and say, you totally misrepresented everything I said. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, the guy writes, Asa Tru is a reconstructionist religion. In a sense, Asa Tru is to ancient Germanic religion what the Living History Museum at Williamsburg, Virginia is to colonial American life. The attempt is to recreate as close as possible what the religious, philosophical and moral mindsets of the ancient northern and or western Germanic uh, individual. And I'm a little bit like, what? 
you actively want your religion would you you actually want your religion to be a living history museum i mean to my mind it's a little bit like saying i mean i want my religion to be a little bit of a superficial pastiche that is detached from people's actual life as a kind of historical larping or something like that i mean that's what a living history museum is right uh, and then my friend uh, here he goes on to criticize what he calls foreignisms he write uh, Foreignisms, either knowingly or unknowingly, brought into Arsatru are distortions of the overall worldview. Some of these distortions are great, some are small, but they remain distortions nevertheless. The reader might well view these additions as being akin to bringing a Dremel tool into a Woodwright shop at the Living History Museum. And this is so in inverted that it almost turns 160 degrees and hits spot on again. <laughs> um, because all culture lives and breathes foreignisms. The idea of a religion as a system of culturally pure elements, you know, that works together uh, without distortion is just wrong, you know. Uh, there is no distortion in that sense, or perhaps it's everywhere. Culture is distortion. Culture is foreignisms. And I mean, we could look at Viking Age religion, and Scandinavia is a good example of this. Scandinavians uh, in, in the Viking Age actively sought the other for religious knowledge. To Viking Age Scandinavians, the other was the Sami. So visiting the Sami was a standard way of acquiring religious knowledge. They call this Jærar Finfara, or Finfaring. Right? Now, note how in the analogy of my reconstructivist friend here, the contemporary electric tool in the Living History Museum, that Dremel tool there, that's actually authentic. That's what you want today if you want to work wood. <laughs> then a Dremel tool is what you want, not a weird pastiche of an imagined past. And this is exactly why I think it's a positive analogy. We should definitely find Dremel tools. We should, I would suggest, the Viking strategy, the Finfara visiting others, as a much better idea than the reconstructivist uh, strategy uh, because the Viking strategy certainly looks for foreignisms um, and uh, finding foreignisms, Dremel tools, uh, can of course be done in many ways and I won't go into that too much here. Um, perhaps contemporary animist theory is one such Dremel tool. Um, yeah. But uh, the perception of culture that underlies this reconstructivist thinking is also problematic. Uh, it is that in a cultural setting, and I'm quoting my reconstructivist friend here, the social mores, legal systems, art, favorite colors, folk music, religion, and stereotypical customs are all expressions of the same worldview. I, but if you're an undergraduate student in my class and you write this as an assignment, you know, then you're going to get a big fat, fat red line under it. That is not how scholarship sees culture today. Culture is not organized in these cultural total machineries of culture where everything is fitted perfectly together. No, you know. Culture is always mixed, it's always conflict-ridden, contradictory, and generally culture is a huge mess. You know? There aren't these machine-like systems where everything works together like cockwheels in an old-fashioned clock. Uh, and, and this is in, in, in this respect, actually, contemporary cultural science uh, is closer to a shamanic animist worldview than to, uh, for instance, a Christian worldview or where everything is very much fitted <laughs> together or is imagined as fitted together. Um, because particularly animist, polytheist, shamanic worldviews, they often have this idea that the world is a little bit of a mess, but it's held together by relating. And I made another video about that. They search for Yggdrasil in, in my channel. Anyway. Um, so, but, so yeah, so culture is not like a coherent machine, like an old, with the, the analogy of an old fashioned clock, you know. And I, but I sometimes see people encapsulating this idea of the monolithical unity of culture and the colonial idea actually of the tribe or being tribal. And that is its own discussion. Uh, but, you know, no, human culture was always complex, conflictual, and interrelated with other human culture. Some cultures have, of course, have higher complexity, uh, but, and, but there are always tensions. 
And again, we can take Viking Age uh, Scandinavia as an example. You have a Jarl, an Earl, a Sith mother, a shaman, shamanism practitioner, a berserk uh, warrior who are living in different places. Now, these people are not representative of one specific worldview. It's quite simply not the way the world works. You know, the, uh, it's like looking at our own time and saying that one single worldview is represented by a conservative uh, corporate executive, a New Age aura healer, and a radicalized jihadist who are perhaps living in different parts of London. You know, no, these persons may share certain contextual features. They may each in their equally paradoxical ways perhaps be representatives of different modernities. They may speak different social lects of uh, the same first language, and they may identify even into the same sort of overall cluster of Abrahamic uh, religiosities. But we don't learn much about them and their passions and their perceptions by reducing them to uh, proponents of one single worldview, right? Um, but let's, ju let's just imagine for a mo moment that this sort of 20th century functionalist totalizing idea of culture was actually true. Then who in their right mind would want to transport themselves into Iron Age Northern Europe as like as a cultural total reality where human sacrifices, endemic war, sacred kinship and a, a strict caste class society where nobles and slaves are like different species is the only thinkable state of affairs. I mean, <laughs> It's preposterous. Sane people do not want to live in the flipping Viking age, you know. And uh, my, my reconstructivist friend, he doesn't root for any, any of these uh, things. But what does happen to his perception is that this demand for a total package of culture that drives him into a kind of an underplayed, defeatist defense of this Iron Age uh, caste society as uh, a kind of natural state of human society. And that's a little bit like... Yeah, that's, that's really not a political po uh, position that I hope a lot of pe a people to, um, are leaning towards. Right, so the fundamental idea is that, that a, or the fundamental problem is that if culture works like that, if there is this tight entire packet of culture, religion, language, and eco-space, historical age, and then of course importing something is absolutely impossible, even in principle. You cannot take something out of that. If you do that, or you cannot, for instance, bring a deity out of the Iron Age and into our age, because everything is so inherently, irrevocably, contextually bound, that then what you get is just something completely out of context, like a penguin in the Sahara, perhaps a living history museum. Right? So I'll just roll back a little bit to the most basic objective of re-engaging pre-Christian traditional religiosities. Uh, and in my view, this has to do with positioning ourselves in relation to modernity. Uh, modernity is characterized by specific models for how to perceive reality. Uh, for instance, there aren't gods inhabiting the world, you know, and if there are, then they're distinct somehow from reality. That's the modern idea. Perhaps they are human imaginations, perhaps they're human psychology, human culture, something inside humanity. Uh, and this distinction is typical of modernity. Now, if we want to decolonize ourselves from modernity and refine a reality where there are indeed gods in the world, I kind of like the idea. Um, if we keep in mind that colonizing, in our case, not to nearly the same extent, includes land theft, genocide, racism, and so on, if, if we're talking about um, uh, your descendants. Um, but that we're talking about an implementation of specific perceptions, a hegemon of reality that has been imposed of us and has ruptured our reality and ruptured us from, from the land and from its inhabitants as our kin, right? Um, but, but if this project of decolonizing ourselves of modernity, uh, then reconstructivism becomes problematic because it's a very modern way of thinking. You know, it builds on traditional 20th century scholarship on Nordic history of religion, uh, and that is modern through and through. And of course you can't decolonize ourselves of modernity with modernity. You know, it's like trying to race red color with red paint or something like that. Um, and we can also not, of course, beam ourselves between contexts. It, it's not possible 
even if it was indeed uh, desire, desirable. We cannot transport uh, ourselves between historic contexts. We have to work from the context that we have, but learn from the ways that people have successfully been dealing with problematic aspects of modernity, right? Uh, because we can indeed relate critically with modern realities. And some call this counter-modernity, uh, or one perspective on this is counter-modernity. Uh, and it might be a little bit of a topic for another video, but I'll just mention it here, um, that uh, African traditional religions have created these traditional, dynamic, and wonderful contemporary polytheisms that are counter-modern. <laughs> um, the uh, Nigerian thinker, Bayo Akomolafe, uh, recently called out to decolonize, not just by conforming to purity imagination of what a true indigenous person looks or sounds like, or by erasing our being defined by modernity, but, he says, by straying freely and losing our way generously, making kin with pl the places that hold us, and abiding with the troubling flow of the worlding practices that bind us to those that have violated us. Right? I think it's a very powerful statement. I just totally love it. Straying freely in main, making kin rather than locking ourselves into imagined uh, purity. Uh, Afro descendants have done this. They mix and relate their deities to the kinds of ideas that have been trying to or have been used to oppress them, uh, and they do this in a very powerful way that successfully creates spaces for African traditional religions today. So, uh, if, if we transfer that kind of thinking to uh, the Nordic case that I mentioned uh, before, where Snor Snorri calls o Odin an all father, th then well. Perhaps this is a Christian perspective of Odin. Well, perhaps it's not. But if you compare to the, the African, Afro-Sendent religions, then you have an old father god called uh, Obatala, which in, uh, in uh, many um, locations is associated with the Christian god. Right? Obatala is associated with the world pillar. Uh, and uh, he's uh, syncretized with uh, the Christian god. Uh, and perhaps could Odin, in a similar way, could be conflated with a Christian idea of an all-father. Perhaps Odin would be given life through this information, uh, this identification, or pulled into closer relation to us, or space would be created for him uh, in, our, in our contexts because we have a Christian background. So if we see Odin as an, as an all-father of the Ubatala type that can be related to Christian imagery, then that could give Odin an anchoring in our cognition and give him reality from our perspective. This is just speculation, you know, that perhaps uh, Odin as an all-father uh, could, uh, could be a good thing, even though it might be Christian influenced. Uh, perhaps this Christian influence is something that people re-engaging Nordic religion should uh, embrace. Uh, it would make him perhaps more real to people in Christian contexts. So, uh, though we might crash question whether he was or was not called an old father in pre-Christian Northern Europe, uh, he, 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 he perhaps has old father realness somehow, um, in any case. So I think Europeans, uh, or you know, your descendants, can re really learn from uh, uh, the, uh, the, the examples where people already seem to be doing this. Uh, there are examples where they already seem to be doing it, uh, your descendants as well. Uh, the American Urklave religion, I don't know so much about it, but it just seems to me to be in this very inherently uh, American diasporic polytheism that follows kind of a model uh, that's comparable to voodoo or Santeria. Uh, and when we look at history of religions, then we also see that exactly this sort of historical kind of mixing is totally an aspect of how people have operated their religion in the encounter with Christianity. And I've given many examples of this in, in, in my channel here, where I've talk, spoken about how different, um, different uh, Nordic deities might have been related to different saints and so on. Right, so summing up, I think the problem with reconstructivism to the level that I understand this project, is that it tries to defeat modernity by implementing more modernity. Uh, and in some cases, it, it works on these erroneous and self-defeating ideas of culture, like from what I've seen, 
Uh, and from what I've seen, it doesn't always particularly work uh, so well. Uh, sometimes you see these funny cases where you have groups of, you know, spaces of people on the internet who seemingly without like much real scholarly background, but who are doing amazing amounts of scholarly kind of almost cock measuring in these online fora. And there's a hyper criticizing in, uh, you know, towards attempts to generate religious knowledge. Um, and what is inherently modernist about this is that the point seemed to be detaching, pushing religious knowledge away by source criticism, for instance, uh, and, and hi hypothesizing about very, very distant contexts. And this locks religion into being an object that we're looking at, investigating, thinking about, perhaps understanding, but it's detached from us. Uh, the, and that, that is the, the very modern, modernist aspect. The uh, British scholar Graham Harvey, he gives a wonderful example of how this modern thinking uh, differs from an animist thinking. Now the root in the Anishinaabe language of the word totem is dodem or something like that, dodem, <laughs> uh, uh, meaning something like a totem or clan. But uh, that doesn't become a whole word before it's coined with a suffix that relates it to something. You can't just say totem, uh, but you can say my clan, my totem, fox clan, fox totem. The relation is inherent to the concept itself. But when this, uh, th this uh, word is borrowed into English and become expressed into modern realities, then it becomes detached. Then the, uh, the totem becomes something that we think about, a kind of spirit animal that we can, yes, think about understand and perhaps believing, perhaps it exists, is a detached thing in people's imagination or culture or something. But to the Anishinaabe, the totem is inherently tied into the relations. Uh, and this is the point of animism, uh, is the opposite of extent externalizing and it, it detaching or thinking about something. It is bringing things close and drawing them into relation. Now, the word religion from Latin, it actually comes from uh, religio, which means uh, which means reconnecting, and there's similar words in, in, in other languages. For instance, Old Norse has the word bond, uh, which means a bond, uh, and you see there's a relation there. I think even the word seder, that there's been uh, speculations that it might be related to some kind of strings or something like that. And um, with, with new animist theory, contemporary scholarship moves into a place where we can actively understand and even perform these kin making almost as, as, as a form of scholarship research we, we can use it to understand how deities work produce and engage deities uh, in a functional and good way and a way that addresses the problems of our age through for instance counter modernity a little bit like voodoo or santeria works deities into being by relating them with different relevant cultural motifs so, uh, as an example, uh, I've been working on a calendar project that was conceived as a kind of, almost like a kind of manual to decolonize your descendant uh, modern reality and find a way back to, to an, an animus reality. And I really f uh, feel aligned with the way that uh, Bayou Akumulave describes the countermodern strategy for decolonizing. That idea of straying generously in order to make kin with the places that hold us. I really recognize the, the feeling of, in uh, Akumulave's description. Like working with this calendar, I didn't try to represent the reckoning in one specific historic context. R rather straying freely, perhaps even losing myself in an like, almost wild dialogue with uh, different contexts of uh, Nordic uh, history of religions, uh, contexts that, that hold different uh, parts of traditional knowledge and seasonal animism and Nordic sacred time, to sort of bring, bring these things out in, into a dialogue with our age. Um, and as such, the, the, the calendar uh, is an, an attempt to use animist scholarship to try to decolonize our reality by suggesting uh, alternatives or perhaps a modification of the idea of reconstructivism. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I think I'm I'm trying to suggest as yeah uh, a way. You could also just say a way of doing reconstructivism uh, to infuse it with 
making kin and counter modernity rather than modernist thinking about as detached from. Yeah, I think that's the point I wanted to make. Cool. Thanks for listening and see you around.